Whether by dint of force or natural charisma, political leaders are often perceived as larger than life. But what happens when their ways of governing aren't so brilliant? From imperial Russia to communist China, people have suffered at the whims of monsters and fools. Blood relatives betrayed, gruesome executions and cruel power plays. These distasteful and sometimes downright evil attempts at governance are best left in the past, despite their poisonous persistence. Are you wondering what this episode is about? Well, this is the last episode of our series, Shocking Events That Made History, and today we're going to talk about shocking events related to leaders and losers. We're going to talk about the Roman Empire, Ivan the Terrible, the real Dracula, Richard III, the Boleyns, the end of the House of Bourbon, Hitler's regrettable ninth life, Mao Zedong's terror teens, April Cruel Day for Saddam Hussein's son, cannibal kings, and then we're going to talk about some shocking events related to war. So don't go anywhere. This is your host, Danny, and this is a new episode from English Plus Podcast. And again, this is the last episode of our series, Shocking Events That Made History. Whether this is the first time you're listening to this series or if you've been following the series since the beginning, you don't want to miss this episode because it has a lot of exciting and, of course, shocking events that made history. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Now, let me remind you that you can find the transcript of this episode on my website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. You can find the link in the show notes. And while you're on the website, check out the different fun learning opportunities you can find on the website. And if you want to unlock all the possibilities on the website, you can become a patron. And there has never been a better time to becoming a patron because starting next week, we're going to have new premium audio series and a lot of benefits specially made for patrons. I'll be talking a lot about that tomorrow. So stay tuned and listen to the episode tomorrow. That is kind of the introduction of a new kind of episodes And at the same time, I'm going to tell you about all the changes that are happening in English+. Plus. And now, without further ado, let's start our episode with the Roman Empire and the Roman revenge and emperors meeting their end. This is coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Roman Emperor Caligula may have been one of the most depraved rulers in history a self-proclaimed god who slept with his own sisters and blissfully reveled in the bloodletting of friend and foe alike. But it wasn't his cruelest excesses that ultimately did in the half-mad monster. Rather, it was his incessant teasing of a particularly sensitive member of the Praetorian Guard. By most ancient accounts, Cassius Chirea was a strong and brave soldier but he was saddled with an unfortunate high-pitched voice that some attributed to a war wound he sustained in the genital region. Caligula rarely missed an opportunity to mock and humiliate his guard. As the ancient chronicler Suetonius reported, whenever the emperor had Kyria kiss his ring, he would hold out his hand, forming and moving it in an obscene fashion. Fed up with the emperor's constant taunts, Kyria plotted his assassination, attracting other disaffected Romans in the process. On January the 24th, the year 41 AD, the deed was done, with Priapus delivering the first thrust of the knife. Royal assassination became something of a trend in the centuries after, but the Roman Empire hit a new low on March the 28th, 193 AD, That's when the elite and swaggering Praetorian Guard slaughtered Emperor Pertinax, ruler of just three months, for trying to restore order and discipline among their ranks. Later the same day, the Guard offered the imperial throne to the highest bidder at auction. And the ancient historian Herodian of Syria wrote, When this proclamation was known, the more honorable and weighty senators and all persons of noble origin and property would not approach the guard barracks to offer money in so vile a manner for a besmirched sovereignty. But there was one wealthy senator, Didius Julianus, who saw an easy opportunity for advancement. Prodded by his ambitious wife and daughter, Julianus rushed over the barracks to make his bid. He offered a fortune and eventually won. 
the people of Rome were disgusted by the charade. Rather than obeisance, they threw rocks at the new emperor and, as Herodian reported, hooted and reviled him as having bought the throne with lucre at an auction. Two months later, Septimus Severus disposed him. And here Julianus reportedly cried, but what evil have I done? And he cried that as he was dragged away to be beheaded. He also cried and said, whom have I killed? And he was the third to be killed that same year with two more to come, suggesting that the most dangerous position in the Roman Empire might be ruler. So that was about some shocking details in the history of the Roman Empire. Of course, that's not the only shocking that you can find in Roman history, but that's one of the most shocking things that made history back in the Roman Empire days. And next, we're going to talk about Ivan the Terrible. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Before Ivan IV became the Terrible, only animals suffered. The gleeful child prince hurled dogs and cats from high towers. But things started to get nasty when, on January the 16th, 1547, Ivan was crowned at age 16 as the first Tsar of all the Russias. Soon, entire cities suffered from the Tsar's increasingly imbalanced fury, most notably the city of Novogorod in 1570. The dangerously paranoid Ivan convinced his people planned to betray him in favor of the king of Poland, ordered the city to be thoroughly sacked. Thousands of men, women, and children, from the elite to the lowliest peasants, were systematically massacred. The rampage continued in Moscow that summer when hundreds of the Tsar's enemies were skinned, boiled, burned, or broken in an orgy of retribution on Red Square. As if that wasn't enough to earn his dreadful epithet, Ivan reached a new low when he murdered his oldest son in a fit of fury. Three years later, in 1584, Ivan himself was mercifully dead. So Ivan the Terrible, he was called for very good reasons. But that's not the last shocking event we're talking about that is related to leaders and losers. Next, we're going to talk about the real Dracula who might be even scarier than the one we find in Bram Stoker's book. So don't go anywhere, I'll be right back to talk about the real Dracula. Four centuries before Bram Stoker's published his tale of the famously bloodthirsty Count in 1897, Vlad III of Wallachia, or Vlad the Impaler, the real Dracula, created a spectacle of death far more frightening than fiction. Vlad's principality, set on the lower Danube River in present-day Romania, was a gruesome battleground as Ottoman forces pushed westward into Christian Europe. As Vio Vode, Vlad had stopped paying an annual tribute to the Ottoman Sultan, and his animosity toward the Turkish, or any threat to his power, was known. On the night of June the 17th, 1462, Vlad and his army surprised a slumbering camp of invading Ottoman Turks, but in all the mayhem he missed killing his intended quarry, the Sultan himself, Mehmed the Conqueror, so Vlad prepared something more chilling for his enemy. Approaching Wallachia's capital of Targovist, the Sultan and his army met a horrific display. Dracula's specialty a virtual forest of spikes impaled upon which were the corpses of some 20,000 captured Turks. So ghastly was the sight that even the Sultan was repulsed, retreating straight away with his terrified army. So do you think the real Dracula is scarier than fiction? Or maybe the fictitious Dracula is scarier? I don't know, you decide. And by the way, in the latest Hollywood Dracula movie, they kind of brought the story to the movie. Of course, they made him larger than life and he was a vampire and he could fly and everything. They added some elements of fiction, but they also added some details from history, from the real Dracula. They kind of mixed it up. I don't know if you watched the movie, it's not my best type of movies or whatever, but it was kind of different from the typical Dracula movies where you find him in a coffin and just like he goes out at night and drinks blood and stuff like that. It's different. So if you haven't watched it, you might want to watch it and it's not a horror movie anyway. But that was about Dracula, and that's not the last shocking event in today's episode. The next event, we're going to talk about Richard III, 
the original Tricky Dick. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Thanks to the titular play by Shakespeare, King Richard has emerged as the wickedest uncle in English history. While there's no definitive proof that he caused the deaths of his young nephews, it's indisputable that he made life miserable for the boys after the death of their father, King Edward IV, on April the 9th, 1483. It was Richard who intercepted the new king, 12-year-old Edward V, as he made his way toward the capital. It was Richard who installed the young sovereign in the Tower of London with his younger brother. It was Richard who managed to have both young men declared bastards and ineligible for the throne. And it was Richard who ended up wearing the crown. The young princes were never seen again. In 1674, while the Tower of London was being renovated, the bones of two young men believed to be those of Edward V and his brother Richard, Duke of York, were uncovered beneath a stairway. Had their uncle ordered their deaths, as many historians believe, no one knows for sure, but he'd at least effectively remove them from any real place in English history. So, that was Richard III, and of course Shakespeare contributed to his fame as the wickedest uncle in English history. And next, we're not going far, we're gonna stay in English history, and we're gonna talk about the Boleyns. So don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. Thomas Boleyn could not have been soaring higher in the court of Henry VIII. He was the king's father-in-law and relished the bounties that this exalted position afforded. But in May 1536, ghastly accusations arose charging incest between his children, Queen Anne Boleyn and George Viscount Rochford. The queen, the salacious indictment read, and here I quote, tempted her brother with her tongue in the said George's mouth and the said George's tongue in hers, and also with kisses, presents, and jewels. Many historians dismiss the allegations as an excuse for King Henry VIII to free himself of Queen Anne, who had yet to bear him a male heir. Contemporaries called the bluff too, a few even bet on George's acquittal. Yet the siblings were condemned in separate trials held on May the 15th. The Boleyn's maternal uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, was left to pronounce the death sentences. Thus, in addition to his prized royal standing, Thomas Boleyn lost his only son to the headsman axe on May the 17th and his daughter Anne to a French swordsman two days later. So that was about King Henry VIII and the unfortunate end of the Boleyn siblings. And next, we're going to go all the way to France and talk about the end of the House of Bourbon. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. The execution of Louis XVI in January 1793 and later that year of Queen Marie Antoinette ended what was known as the Ancien Régime in France. But for the surviving members of the Bourbon royal dynasty, it was only the beginning of their troubles. Bad luck and poor decisions plagued the family for the next three decades until it finally buried them altogether. The Bourbon monarchy didn't quite end when the guillotine severed Louis XVI's head in 1793. His only son automatically became Louis XVII. But there would be no crown for the seven-year-old boy, only isolated imprisonment and vile mistreatment at the hands of his captors. And one time a doctor was allowed to see him and the doctor reported that the child was a victim of the most abject misery and of the greatest abandonment. When the child succumbed to disease in 1795, his uncle succeeded him in exile as Louis XVIII. But Napoleon Bonaparte was destined to rule France next, so Louis XVIII bided his time as a guest in other kingdoms until Bonaparte stumbled by invading Russia and was driven into exile at Elba. The Bourbon restoration seemed assured, as Louis was invited back to France in 1814 to rule as a constitutional monarch. And except for a brief exile the following year when Napoleon escaped Elba and stormed back to France, the obese and gouty king ruled in relative peace until his death in 1824. 
Then his brother and successor, the ultra-conservative Charles X, blew it for the Bourbons once and for all. The new king was determined to rule as an absolute monarch, as if the lessons of the revolution had been lost on him entirely. Charles dispensed with the constitutional restraints his predecessor had adopted by August 2, 1830, in the midst of a burgeoning second revolution, the last bourbon of the direct royal line was forced to abdicate, taking with him any notion that rule by divine right could be reconciled with France's new leanings toward democracy. So, with Charles X came the end of the House of Bourbons in France. Next, let's move all the way to Germany to talk about the infamous Hitler, of course, and to talk about his regrettable ninth life. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Adolf Hitler was born in Austria on April the 20th, 1889. With that, he had shared the fate of his siblings, Gustav, Ida, Otto, and Edmund, who all died before the age of six. The bloodiest conflict in human history might have been avoided. Although, I do believe that it was going to happen anyway, with or without Hitler. If there was no Hitler, there would be a Hitler. But anyway, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about Hitler's regrettable ninth life, right? So, Hitler didn't die before the age of six like his brothers and sisters. Instead, Adolf survived his childhood, two significant injuries during World War I, and at least six assassination attempts before his rise to power in 1933. An Englishman by the name of Henry Tandy may have also unwittingly assisted the future Fuhrer when both were soldiers fighting on opposite sides during the Battle of Marcoin in World War I. An injured Hitler is said to have passed through Tandy's line of fire. Tandy recalled years later, and he said, and here I quote what Tandy said, I took aim, but couldn't shoot a wounded man, so I let him go. Although some historians cast doubt on Hitler's claim that he was among the men whom Tandy spared, the young private's humane decision to hold fire would haunt him for the rest of his life. And here, I'm quoting Tandy, If only I had known what he would turn out to be, when I saw all the people, women, and children he had killed and wounded, I was sorry to God I let him go. So whether this story is true or not, whether he was really in the line of fire of Tandy, or that was just like one more thing for propaganda, because Hitler tended to do that a lot. He used to brag about surviving all these assassination attempts because he thought he was protected by God. And what a surprise! I mean, if you look at history and see all these tyrannical maniacs and murderers, almost all of them do all these hideous things they do in the name of God. But anyway, that was Hitler's regrettable ninth life, whether that story was right or not, but it was one of the most shocking events that made history, and that's why it made it to our series and to the last episode where we're going to talk about shocking events related to leaders, losers, and wars. And next, we're going to talk about Mao Zedong's terror teens. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. After nearly starving China to death, with his failed great leap forward, Mao Zedong unleashed a brand new misery upon his people. His so-called cultural revolution was meant to destroy every vestige of ancient culture or Western influence. It was enforced by surly teenagers who were transformed into Red Guards, millions of whom, as reporter Robert Elegant wrote, stalked across the vast nation like hordes of enraged soldier ants. This decade-long spiral into insanity began on May the 16th, 1966, and upended the country's traditional respect for elders. Mere youths wielded ultimate control over personal property, human dignity, and even life, a power they sorely abused. Zhang Hongbing was one of the millions of teenagers blindly beholden to Chairman Mao and left to cope with the wreckage of his own actions after Mao died in 1976. Zhang's denouncement of his own mother had led to her summary execution in 1970. And here I quote what Zhang said in 2013. He said, I see her in my dreams, just as young as she was then. I kneel on the floor, clutching her hands, for fear she will disappear. Mom, I cry, 
I beg your forgiveness, but she doesn't respond. Never once has she answered me. This is my punishment. I mean, of course, that was just one example of the atrocities that happened. And I want to make something clear here. When we talk about people, I mean, we talked about Hitler. Well, that doesn't belittle the German people or Germany as a country in any way. And also Mao Zedong, that doesn't belittle China in any way. I mean, China has one of the richest cultures in our history. And we're not talking about people who belong to certain countries. Now, if you've been following along in the series, you know that there is no discrimination and I talked about almost everybody. But the point is that certain people were given the power or they kind of seized an opportunity they had and they were kind of lucky. And I, I can't explain why luck comes to people like that. And of course, they were cunning. They were clever in a way. Megalomaniacs, of course, but they were clever nonetheless. And while they had the chance to use all that power they had to bring peace and prosperity upon their people, they made their people and some of them, even the rest of the world, suffer. And millions of people died because of it. So I can't imagine anything more shocking than this, but that's not the last shocking event in today's episode because we still have more. And next, we're going to talk about Turkmenistan's lunatic leader. That's what we're going to talk about next. I'll be right back. Though Turkmenistan gained independence from the USSR on October the 27th, 1991, it was left with a dictator, Sapar Murat Niazov, who writer Paul Thoreau described as one of the wealthiest and most powerful lunatics on earth. He banned beards and ballet car radios, the opera, and gold teeth, which were ordered to be extracted. He commissioned bizarre feats of engineering with the vast wealth he plundered, in part from his impoverished country's natural gas profits. Reminders of Niazov's omnipotence and preening narcissism were raised everywhere. On banners, billboards, paper currency, and in schools. A 250-foot gold-plated statue of him stood atop the Arch of Neutrality in the capital city of Ashgabat and constantly rotated to face the sun. Niazov once told a journalist, and here I quote, of course, I admit it, there are too many portraits, pictures, and monuments of me. I don't find any pleasure in it, but the people demand it because of their mentality. Fortunately, Turkmenistan's era of being a gigantic madhouse run by the maddest patient, as Toro described it, expired when the dictator himself did in 2006. But if you think he was the only lunatic in modern history, think again. Because next we're gonna talk about Saddam Hussein's son, Uday, and what came to be known as April Cruel Day. That's coming next, don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. When Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein's maniacal son Uday wasn't torturing people to death or plundering the state to fund his lavish lifestyle, he loved a good gag. And what better occasion than April Fool's Day, or as it is called in Iraq, Kizbet Nisan, which are the Arabic words for April lie. On April the 1st, 1998, the Uday-owned newspaper Babel published a front-page article declaring that the UN sanctions imposed after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait would be lifted. On the second page, readers were let in on the joke, which no doubt left thousands of deprived and malnourished Iraqis howling with laughter. Uday topped himself the next year with the outrageous announcement that meager food rations would henceforth be supplemented with bananas, chocolate, and soft drinks. A few years, and more perverse shenanigans later, a deadly raid put an end to Uday and his antics. And next, we're gonna move all the way to Africa, and we're gonna talk about one of the most distasteful coronations in history. So don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. On December the 4th, 1977, an accused cannibal crowned himself Emperor of the Central African Republic. Despite the nation's abject poverty, Jean Bedel Bokassa insisted on a coronation ceremony as lavish as his hero Napoleon's a century and a half before. It cost nearly $25 million, which is almost a quarter of his nation's annual income. To prepare for the extravaganza, Bokassa turned to France, the country that had backed his coup in 1966. 
A sculptor constructed a two-ton gilded throne in the shape of an eagle with outstretched wings. On Coronation Day, His Imperial Majesty was bedecked in attire designed by the 200-year-old French firm that had dressed Napoleon himself. Most of the world's leaders declined invitations to the event. After the crowning, guests feasted on piles of caviar and sturgeon, washed down with thousands of bottles of vintage wine and champagne. Evidently, there was another, less palatable delicacy on the menu, too. When the guests had consumed their fill, the emperor whispered to French Minister of Cooperation Robert Galley, and here I quote what the emperor said, You never noticed, but you ate human flesh. So I don't know how shocking that might be, but it is very shocking. And the problem is that sometimes those maniacs, those lunatics, those even cannibals, they are backed at some point by some of the most sophisticated countries in the world. So there is kind of controversy. I know, I'm not saying that France is bad, of course not. But what I'm saying is that sometimes, because of those dirty politics, and because of some benefits they want to get, they are ready, some countries are ready to back the devil, to enslave all the people and get his ways, even, you know, just like for this Bokassa cannibal, it cannibalism. I know this is all kind of unimaginably crazy, but maybe that's kind of a red alarm for countries who have power. I mean, we all know that you have the power to support and even to implant some kind of ruler in developing countries or as politically incorrect known as third world countries. When you want to support someone and bring that person to power, just make sure you're not bringing a lunatic to power. But it's kind of difficult, you know, because this person has to agree to sell his country in return of him becoming a ruler. So it's kind of a trade-off and it's kind of difficult to find a righteous man to accept such a deal. But anyway... We're not talking about politics here, and I'm not going to get any further into politics, but these examples should raise alarms. And to be honest, it's not efficient, because most of these people failed, and the people who backed them failed with them. So maybe just for a change, look for some righteous people and back these people, maybe to build countries that will become your allies in the future. Even the people of these countries would become your allies, not just a couple of rulers here and there. Anyway, let me just stop talking about politics because I don't know where that will take me. And next, we're going to move on and talk about shocking events that have to do with war and discord. Now, of course, war is always shocking. Any kind of war is shocking because there is no reason in the world we should kill each other over anything. But we do. And this thing is not going to change, I guess, because we've been doing it since the dawn of man. And we're going to continue doing this until the sunset of man as well. Maybe one of these wars will just bring our downfall eventually. But anyway, next we're going to talk about the charge of the blind king. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. King John I of Bohemia was a brave warrior. No doubt about that. But he was also blind, well, which was uh, obviously a distinct disadvantage in any battle, particularly so on August the 26th, 1346, when John and his ally Philip VI of France faced the English army of Edward III at Grecy. With the introduction of the lethally efficient English longbow, warfare took a decided turn in this clash of kings. John, however, was undeterred, eager for action. The sightless monarch who was, at age 50, well past his prime, gathered his most loyal comrades around him. And according to the contemporary chronicler Jean Froissart, King John said to those comrades, and here I quote, Sirs, you are my men, my companions and friends in this journey. I require you bring me so far forward that I may strike one stroke with my sword. To accommodate their king and guide him into the thick of the battle, the men tied all the reins on their horses together and charged. As Froissart concluded his account of the ill-fated effort, they adventured themselves so forward that they were there all slain, and the next day they were found in the place about the king. So, here you might say that was kind of a brave thing to do, but for me it's kind of a stupid thing to do, because why would you just go to your death? Because of what? What's the point? 
Why would you just, like, so valiantly go to death? To defend what? To defend your king, who cares nothing about you? Or who just wants to die a glorious death? But of course, I will have to say that this happened a long time ago, and back then, ideas were different. But till now, some people are still doing it. Well, not for a king, but for people who care nothing about them. They are ready to die for people who don't give anything about them. But anyway... That was the charge of the Blind King, our first shocking event that has to do with wars. But it's definitely not the last. We're going to talk about an unfortunate footnote to the Civil War. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse in April 1865, prompting his Union counterpart Ulysses S. Grant to declare, and here I quote what Grant said, the war is over, the rebels are our countrymen again. But it was not to be. One final skirmish would prolong the bloodshed. On May 12 and 13, 1865, Union and Confederate forces confronted one another along the banks of the Rio Grande near Brownsville, Texas, in what became known as the Battle of Palmito Ranch. The fighting started when Union Colonel Theodore H. Barrett ordered an attack on the Confederate camp, possibly because he was eager to see action before the war's end, or possibly because he needed horses. Whatever the case, what followed was a small, insignificant clash with relatively few casualties on the heels of the bloodiest four years in American history. The Confederacy triumphed with the capture of dozens of Union soldiers, but it would not change the reality that the South had been defeated. Among the casualties of battle was the luckless Union private John Jefferson Williams, who earned the dubious distinction of being the last soldier killed in the Civil War that had already ended. So that was something shocking. Of course, the Civil War in its entirety was shocking, but... You know, we're just talking about some shocking events that you might not have heard of. I'm pretty sure that you know a lot about the Civil War, but maybe not about this little detail I just mentioned as one of our shocking events that made history. And next, we're going to talk about the wrong turn that led to World War I. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Call it the bad day that almost wasn't. The plot by a band of Serbian nationalists to assassinate Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, had failed. Or so it seemed. As the Archduke and his wife Sophie traveled through Sarajevo by motorcade, one of the six killers tossed a bomb at their car, but it bounced off the back and detonated under the vehicle behind them, severely wounding the occupants and a number of bystanders the motorcade sped away to a reception at the city hall. The Archduke decided to cancel the rest of the scheduled events for that day and instead visit those wounded by the assassination attempt. The plan was to drive straight to the hospital along a route that would avoid the city center, but the driver was given wrong information and took a right turn on Franz Joseph Street. One of the assassins having dispersed from the scene with the others happened to be eating at a nearby deli when he spotted the Archduke's car. The young man seized the unexpected opportunity. The rest of the story is all too well known. The murder of Franz Ferdinand in part triggered the inexorable march toward the First World War, one of the bloodiest conflicts in the history of man. So, it was just this one wrong turn that kind of, of course, that was not the only reason, but that kind of led to World War I. That was shocking enough to make it to our series, Shocking Events That Made History, and it is not the last one. We still have a few more shocking events before the entire series is over, because remember, today is the last episode of our series, Shocking Events That Made History. So don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. Now, this shocking event is not exactly related to war, but the shocking thing about it was kind of caused by the war. And we're still talking about World War I, but it has to do with a movie. And that happened in 1917. Producer Robert Goldstein made a seemingly patriotic revolutionary war epic called The Spirit of 76. 
an earnest recreation of such all-American episodes as Paul Revere's Midnight Ride and the signing of the Declaration of Independence, there were also less wholesome depictions of the villainous British bayonetting babies and dragging away American girls by the hair. And that's where Goldstein and his film ran afoul of the US government. The United States was just entering World War I in May 1917 when the spirit of 76 was screened in Chicago. With its patriotic themes, the timing of the film's debut seemed perfect. The authorities thought otherwise. Goldstein was ordered to cut the scenes of British atrocities lest they inflame the public while the country fought side by side with Britain in Europe. The producer complied, but when the film premiered in Los Angeles on November the 27th, the excised scenes had been restored. Goldstein was arrested and charged under the recently passed Sweeping Espionage Act. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison and though he served only three, his stilted representations of British atrocities from a century and a half earlier had made him an enemy of the state and he was a ruined man. So, it's kind of strange, you know, just like when the government tells you when to tell the truth and when not to tell the truth, because now it's not the time. And sometimes when you tell the truth, you may become a spy, who knows? But anyway, again, let's not get into politics, and next we're gonna talk about President Woodrow Wilson when he was out of his league. That's coming next, don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. The Treaty of Versailles, especially its provision for a League of Nations, was precious to Woodrow Wilson. He called it one of the greatest documents of human history, reflecting as it did his vision for a new world order. The president advocated for his treaty with uncompromising zeal, prompting French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau to refer to him contemptuously as Jesus Christ. Wilson lacked divine inspiration, however, when it came to dealing with his political adversaries, particularly Henry Cabot Lodge, the Republican Senate Majority Leader, the two despised each other. Wilson neglected to include Lodge or any of his Republican opponents in formulating the treaty in Paris. On July 10, 1919, Wilson went to Capitol Hill to deliver the treaty. Concluding his speech to the Senate, the President asked, and here I quote, Shall we or any free people hesitate to accept this great duty? The answer from the Republicans was a resounding yes. Lodge was especially outspoken about his objections to the League, which he felt obligated the United States to intervene in international quarrels in which it had no interests. With his cherished treaty imperiled, Wilson determined to tour the West and sell his vision directly to the American people. He had to cut the trip short because of failing health, and soon after he returned to Washington, he suffered a massive stroke. With Wilson debilitated, Lodge sensed a new opportunity to gut the treaty. On November the 19th, for the first time in its history, the Senate voted against a peace treaty. As far as the United States was concerned, the League of Nations was dead. Four years later, so was Wilson. When the president's widow learned that Lodge was planning to represent the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at his funeral, she sent him a curt note requesting that he not attend. He obliged. During the subsequent years of instability in Europe, Hitler remobilized and made Nazi Germany into a world power, which eventually led to an even bloodier world war than the first. Now next, we're gonna talk about Neville Chamberlain's fleeting peace. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. We have just a couple of more shocking events before we conclude this episode and our entire series. Stay tuned. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returned from Germany on September the 30th, 1938 with a pact he was certain would ensure peace for Britain. A crowd roared its approval when he read from the document he had signed with Adolf Hitler struck with the intent that our two peoples never go to war with one another again. Chamberlain and other European leaders had just negotiated the Munich Agreement, which allowed Germany to claim most of Czechoslovakia in exchange for the guarantee that the Third Reich's territorial ambitions would end there. For a nation with fresh memories of the Great War's carnage, the diplomacy made Chamberlain a hero. Returning to his residence, he shouted his immortal message to the masses. And here I quote what he said, Peace for our time. 
While his triumph was short-lived, Hitler soon broke the agreement and Chamberlain resigned in 1940. Winston Churchill, who'd from the start declared the Munich Agreement a defeat, rallied Britain through the Second World War. And next, we're going to talk about something related to General Douglas MacArthur. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. The end of the story, Allied victory gives us General Douglas MacArthur, the hero, who returned as promised to liberate the Philippines at the close of World War II. But his opening gambit in that conflict was less than brilliant. Indeed, it was a fiasco with a Japanese aerial attack that caught MacArthur entirely unprepared. Japanese bombers were surprised a day after Pearl Harbor to find such a vulnerable target outside Manila. Nearly half the entire U.S. Army Air Forces in the Far East parked in neat peacetime formation. They destroyed the base in a few hours and with it, any viable defense of the Philippines. As one Japanese officer later recalled, we were very worried because we were sure after learning of Pearl Harbor, you would disperse your planes or make an attack on our base at Formosa, which is present-day Taiwan. But for some reason, MacArthur did neither. The general's biographer, William Manchester, called MacArthur's inaction one of the strangest episodes in American military history. So yes, the end of the story, we know that General Douglas MacArthur is the hero, but his start was not all that brilliant. And trust me, of course, I'm not saying that he was not a brilliant man in the end, but many of these victories were achieved by the blood, sweat, and tear of the man on the ground, of those soldiers who gave their lives to get these victories. And yes, of course, they were the strategists, those leaders, those colonels and generals, etc. But those men brought victory more than anybody else. But anyway, again, no politics, only shocking events in our series. And next, we're going to talk about something that is related to Lieutenant General George S. Patton. So don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Lieutenant General George S. Patton strode into a military evacuation hospital on August the 3rd, 1943. In the midst of the Sicily campaign of World War II, he came upon Private Charles H. Cool. Slouched on a stool looking too well to be there, Patton demanded to know where he was hurt, to which Private Cool reportedly replied with a shrug that he was not wounded but nervous. The hard-bitten Patton would have none of it. And here I'm quoting what his biographer Martin Blumenson wrote. The general immediately flared up, cursed the soldier, called him all types of a coward, then slapped him across the face with his gloves and finally grabbed the soldier by the scruff of his neck and kicked him out of the tent. The enraged general demanded that Cool immediately be sent back to the front. During a hospital visit seven days later, he encountered another malingerer, Private Paul G. Bennett, who had been removed from the front, suffering all the symptoms of what was then known as battle fatigue. Patton came up to the shivering young man and asked what the trouble was. And Bennett responded, It's my nerves. I can't stand the shelling anymore. Patton screamed here, Your nerves, hell! You are just a goddamn coward! Shut up that goddamn crying! After slapping Bennett twice, Patton barked, You're getting back to the front lines and you may get shot and killed! In fact, I ought to shoot you myself, you goddamn whimpering coward. With that, Patton pulled out his pistol, prompting the hospital's commander to physically separate the two. Patton left the tent still yelling. Patton's superior general, Dwight D. Eisenhower, was appalled upon hearing of the slapping incidents and wrote to the general questioning his judgment and future usefulness in the aftermath. Patton was forced to apologize to the men he had abused, which he did grudgingly and was effectively sidelined for the next 11 months. Private Cool later took a benign view of the incident, and here I quote what he said about Patton. He said, Patton was pretty well worn out. I think he was suffering a little battle fatigue himself. Fortunately for the Allies, the general's aggression was better directed on the battlefield. The Sicily campaign was a tremendous success, and his third army made major contributions to the Allied drive toward Germany after D-Day. Well, sometimes these things are excusable. I mean, battle fatigue, the nerves, the pressure, it affects all men, especially in times of war. But still, these were shocking things to hear about, especially from a decorated general like George S. Patton. 
So that was one more shocking event in our series, Shocking Events That Made History, and we've come to the very last event and the very last shocking events in our series, and that's something happened in Norway, the Rockets Red Scare. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. A bad day averted can still be a very bad day. And that was when the world was just a blink away from nuclear annihilation on January the 25th, 1995. That morning, a joint US-Norwegian scientific team launched a four-stage rocket from an island off Norway's northeastern coast to study the Aurora Borealis. Only problem was, the Russians were never alerted to the launch and the rocket's appearance in the sky deeply unnerved them. It resembled U.S. Trident missiles and came from a region the Russians had long considered threatening. What resulted was the single most dangerous moment of the nuclear missile age. And these were the words Peter Vincent Pry, who was a former CIA official, used to describe that war scare. President Boris Yeltsin and the Russian high command, their fingers poised over the button that could lead to Armageddon, had only minutes to decide whether to strike back with the 4,700 strategic warheads at their disposal. Fortunately for the fate of mankind, the rocket headed away from Russian airspace and fell into the sea. The button remained unpushed, and the lesson of that day became less about the Aurora Borealis than rocket notification protocols. But you know what? If you come to think about it, the whole thing is kind of crazy. I mean, would you keep a bomb at your own house and you know that this bomb might trigger any minute? Now, of course, you had it under control and you have your security protocols and whatever, but it may trigger any moment. Maybe if one of your children kind of figures out the way to push that red button. Now, of course, I know it's not that simple as they show us in movies, but if they kind of figure out a way to trigger that button and blow up the house, what would you do then? Of course, you wouldn't do anything because you would be dead. But the point is, why would you have a bomb like this in your house in the first place? Why do we have all these nuclear weapons? Who are we going to destroy? We know that the moment we're going to use one of these nuclear missiles on each other, it's going to be the end of everything. So why are we keeping them? I mean, countries spend trillions of dollars building their nuclear arsenal. For what? Are they really going to use it one day? Are they really going to end life as we know it? And then we will be in one of those science fiction movies or maybe even video games when there's nothing but a wasteland and some kind of ugly creatures roaming around and just trying to kill us. And actually, we don't need those creatures to kill us because we will be killing each other for resources for food and water and stuff like that. Anyway, it's a grim picture, I know. It is shocking and maybe one of the most shocking things that can ever happen that we hope never happens. But you never know. All it takes is one mistake or one foolish act by one foolish person, and I just told you about a lot of lunatics. And we have a lot of them in history and present day, and we will always have these lunatics. What if they have the power to launch one of these missiles and just launch the entire world into this nuclear Armageddon? Wouldn't it be wiser just to forget about this whole thing, to dismantle this whole arsenal? Why do we keep weapons that would kill each and every last one of us? I don't know. That's kind of power play that people who are as stupid as I am will never understand. But anyway, that was the last shocking event in today's episode and actually in the entire series. That is the last episode of our series, Shocking Events That Made History. Thank you very much for making it this far into the episode, for listening to the entire episode, actually. And I would like to remind you that you can find the transcript of this episode on my website. The link is in the description. While you're there, just take a look at the other learning opportunities, the other fun learning opportunities, and other than learning as well, on my website. And there's something special for patrons, so just check it out and become a patron. And especially now, it's the perfect time to become a patron, not only to support me and support my podcast, which is, of course, vital in order to survive and continue, but also you will get great benefits. And starting from next week, We will have a lot of premium content, premium audio episodes and series will be exclusively available to my patrons on Patreon. The link is also in the description of the episode. Take the link, go to Patreon, become a patron today and take your learning and fun to the next level. With that being said, I would like to thank you again for listening to another episode from English Plus Podcast. This is your host, Danny. I will see you next time.